anyway. Yes, okay, we are now recording this evening's session. So we are in session three of our Lenten Bible studies entitled The Cross of Christ. And you remember that we've been looking at different aspects of the cross. We're trying to build up a complete picture. And insofar as our limited understanding is allows us to have a better grasp of the cross of Christ. So in the first session, we looked at our role as disciples, as followers of Jesus. And we looked at Jesus's teaching on the cross before the cross. And then in our second session, we looked at the cross as the power of God and the, and the wisdom of God. And I said, based on how the cross was perceived in the first century world, in, in, in the life and the times of Jesus and Paul and all the other gospel writers, the cross didn't really make sense. But we looked at a great passage from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, his first letter to the Corinthians, in which he demonstrates that even though it doesn't make sense logically to our own minds and to our own reasoning, the cross demonstrates the power of God, the wisdom of God. Tonight for our session, I want us to look at the cross as the generosity of God. So how, how do we understand the cross as God's generous act in Christ Jesus? So that is the focus of our, of, of our study tonight. A little story that would lead us into this evening session. Well, it's not really a story. It's, it, it, it's a reflection of my own that I had this afternoon. You have one of these profound moments when you're I, I was trying to do some gardening this afternoon and in the background in, in our back streets I heard this I, I think four days into spring there was there was an ice cream truck out and about in in, in the estate and those of you who live in estates where you have ice cream trucks you will know that ice cream trucks play a little jingle to attract the children and attract whoever is interested in ice cream and here's a, here I was trying to do some gardening and this ice cream truck went by in the back street and it went by again and I heard that jingle again and again and again and again and again and I had this profound thought I asked myself I wonder what it would be like to be an ice cream truck man an ice cream truck driver. And the reason why I asked that question was because I thought to myself, here I was being completely driven out of my mind by that jingle on the ice cream truck. And I thought to myself, what would it be like to be an ice cream truck driver hearing that day in and day out all the time, almost to a deafening noise. So I, I, I tried picturing various scenarios and I thought, okay, maybe I'll have alternative music with headphones that would block out the jingle on my truck so I don't have to listen to that. Anyway, after some further profound reflections, I came to the conclusion, no, I would rather not be an ice cream truck driver. I'm quite happy to be doing what I'm doing, even though I don't much like gardening, I'd rather be in the garden than in. Well, what's the point of those words of wisdom? What was the point of sharing with you my profound reflection of two o'clock this afternoon? I'll tell you what it is. In relation, because at the playing at the back of my mind was this evening's session. And the passage that I'm going to be focusing on is all about exchanges. And here I was sitting there thinking, I, I, I hate the sound of that jingle of the ice cream truck, and I wouldn't want to exchange what I'm doing in order to be an ice cream truck driver. No, thank you. That's not something that is high up on my list of possible professions at some point in life. With that kind of silly reflection in your minds, I want you to turn to a passage of scripture that I'm hoping to look at tonight. And that is to demonstrate the generosity of God. So if you have your Bibles, could you please turn with me to Paul's letter to the Philippians. 
and the second chapter. So we're looking at Philippians chapter two. Now, before I actually draw your attention to the passage that I'm wanting to study tonight, Paul wrote this letter when he was in prison. He was in a prison, but he wrote to the church in Philippi. So his circumstances were not great. He was a political prisoner, but yet he had the freedom to rewrite and reflect. And he was writing to this church, encouraging them, encouraging their faith. And Paul's nature was such that it didn't matter that he was at that point in time facing various disadvantages being a prisoner. It didn't matter that he was in an oppressive state. All that he could think of was to encourage the Church of God in Philippi, and he writes to them this letter, which we now know as the letter to the Philippians. And in doing so, he, he boosts up the, the, the church at Philippi, he encourages their faith, he, he tells them to keep pressing on in their faith journey. And then he, he tells them that they need to be more Christ-like. He says to them, we need to have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. We need to be in our thoughts and in our actions and in our behaviors, in, in our relationships, more Christ-like, because that's what our Christian discipleship is all about. And then in doing so, he comes out with these brilliant words that I'm sure many of you perhaps know by heart. But I want us to focus on tonight, and that is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 onwards. And let me read it to you. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself taking on the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, Every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and, on, and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Profound words, brilliant words. It just rolls off the tongue of St. Paul. It, 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 it was possible that this, these words were used as an ancient hymn amongst earliest Christian communities because it celebrated the glory of Christ. It celebrated the, the, the suffering and the humiliation of Christ just as much as it ce celebrated the exaltation of Christ who is lifted up above all that we can possibly conceive. And God honored Jesus in, in, in that manner. I want for us to reflect on this passage, thinking of it in terms as the generosity of God. And when we start breaking it down, we start thinking of it in more detail. We we, we realize that it's not as straightforward as it seems. Now, I just need to give you a little bit of, of, of sociological background in order for us to understand this passage better. In the world of Paul, especially when we think of the world, the known world to Paul that was being ruled over by the Romans, the Roman Empire, there were two main categories of people in society. There were those who were the free people and there were those who were the slaves. Now, to our modern years, this 
might be difficult for us to accept because we live in a world where slavery has truly been abolished, where although it was accepted in about the 17th, 18th century, there was this, the, the act of the abolition of slavery that came about that completely rooted out slavery. And nowadays it's completely condemned. You would see in various websites, especially uh, websites of big companies, they, they, they normally have a little bit on modern slavery act. You may have noticed that. And that, that more or less says that there's that company is not involved in any form of trafficking or anything that can be associated with what is now known as modern day slavery. But remember in Jesus's day, in Paul's day, especially because Paul was going around to various Roman colonies, slavery was an acceptable part of life. life society depended on slaves in order to perform certain functions. So in order for things to get done in society, they depended on slave labor. So we need to realize and we need to be careful here before we jump at it and say, oh, that doesn't exist anymore. Yes, it doesn't exist anymore in our day and age, but we also need to make concession for the fact that Paul was living in a world in which this was uh, an integral part of his world. And so he, he addresses slavery and talks about slavery as if it was, well, normal, because that's what it was. So the two big categories in Paul's day and age was those who were slaves and those who were free. And obviously, if you were free, you were in a better off position than if you were a slave. And in a Roman world, because Rome was the superpower of the day, the Romans were always seen to be the free people and they had slaves working for them and under them. So that's just a bit of a back, basic background that I will make reference to as we look into this passage in more depth. So he begins in verse five of chapter two, of encouraging people to have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. And then he begins to unpack what Christ Jesus' mind was, how, how Jesus saw things, and he encourages us to have a similar kind of mindset. And so in, in verse six, he makes his initial statement about the identity of Jesus. He says, Jesus, who though he was in the form of God. Now, the form of God here in this context denotes a kind of, well, not a kind of, it, 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 it denotes divinity. Jesus was God. That was part of his very essence. That was part of his makeup. That was part of his being. That was who he was. And although he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. Now, at this point, I would be interested to hear from you from various Bibles that are represented in this group. What verse 6 says in your Bibles. So let, let's let's start with uh, Father Jed, simply for no other reason but for the fact that you showed us very proudly your Jerusalem Bible. So let's hear what the Jerusalem Bible says, uh, Father Jed. Verse 6. You need to unmute yourself. His state was divine, yet he did not cling to his equality with God. That's right. Okay, thank you. He did not cling. So we, 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 we worked out the first part. So my version, which is I use the new Exploits. revised standard version. So um, the form of God that the Jerusalem Bible says divine nature. And where my Bible talks about he did not count equality with God is something to be exploited, that version, Jerusalem Bible says he did not want to cling to God. 
Right, let's let's have some other versions. I heard somebody talk about, yeah, uh, Shirley. It did not consider equality with God, something to be grasped. Something to be grasped, right. Okay, so cling, grasp, exploit. We've got three words now. Anyone else? With a the Living word? Bible says, yep. who, though, yeah. who though he was God, did not demand and cling to his rights as God. Right, again, so demand and cling to his right as God. So that's the same word again, yeah. Uh, Sheila, did you have your hand oh, up? Yeah, Life Application Bible. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Cling to, so that word seems to be coming up again and again. Any other words? Yeah, Christine, and then Joan. The Pover Poverty and Justice Bible. Yeah. Christ was truly God, but he did not try to remain equal with God. Right, okay, he didn't try to remain equal with God, yeah. Okay, Joan? Good News Bible says, he always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Okay, thank you for that. So he, by, he didn't think that by force he needs to remain equal to God. So we've got words like exploited, grasp, cling, remain equal, force, that kind of equality. And all of those indicate to us that this word that is being translated from the Greek denotes that Jesus was God. I think all the Bibles are very clear in making that point plain, that his divine nature was very much there. But he didn't want to exploit that or cling to that. Literally, literally the word is he didn't want to grasp it as in steal it or, or, or pry it by, by force. It was his by right. He didn't want to say, I'm not giving this up at all. This is mine. This is mine to keep. I'm holding on to it. I'm holding on to it as tightly as I can and nothing is going to take it or pry it out of my hands. So keep that in mind. He did not, although he had it all, he didn't hold on to it. He didn't want to hold it for himself. He didn't count it as something that he should take advantage of. He didn't want to exploit it. He didn't want to cling to it. He didn't want to grasp it. He didn't want to say, I have the divine nature and that's about it. I'm not going to budge from my very privileged, esteemed, high up position. And then let's, let, let's look at verse seven. Again, my version says that the, the first line of verse seven, I'm um, only wanting this first line, but he emptied himself. Let's hear what other versions say. The first line of verse 7. The NIV yeah, Paul. says he, made, he yes. made himself nothing. That's the NIV. He made himself, yeah, okay, he made himself nothing. nothing. Thanks, Esther. Paul? It says, but laid aside his mighty power and glory taking the disguise of a slave. Right, okay, the first part. Thank, thank you, Paul. So he, 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 laid, he laid aside his mighty glory, do you say? Yeah. Mighty power and glory. His mighty power, yeah. Yeah, anyone else? Yeah. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. Right, okay. Uh, just the first being. line, she oh, sorry. So he sorry. gave up his, no, that's fine. He gave up his divine position. Christine. Instead, he gave up everything. He gave up everything. everything. Right, okay, thanks. Everything. Okay, let, let, let's, okay, Joan, go for that and then let's work with what we have. Sorry, do you want that? Yeah, go on, Joan. In, instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. Right, okay, thanks. He gave up all he had. So, again, all of the versions, whether he made himself nothing or he, he in, in my version, he emptied himself or he laid aside his power, gave up his divine position, he gave up everything. 
it it here shows or it, it, it works in direct contrast to what was said just earlier. He didn't want to cling on to his divinity. It would say a lot to them, wouldn't it? Use it that way for them to well, think. He didn't want to cling on to his divinity. Rather, on the other hand, he was willing to give up not some of it, not half of it, not three quarters of it, but he was willing to give up everything completely totally it was a complete emptying of himself think think about that 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 that's a mind-blowing thought because just now we've established the fact that jesus had this complete divine nature it was his by right it was his to hold on to but he didn't want to hold on to it he didn't want to he didn't want to dig in his heels and say, I am not giving this up. This is mine. This is how who I am. This is how I will always be. He gave it just as it were, just as much as it was his in totality. He also gave it up in totality, not holding on to a shred, but giving it up completely. He emptied himself. And the second part of the verse says, he took on the form of a slave. Now, I want you to contrast this with the first line of verse six. It says, he was in the form of God. And now in verse seven, the second part talks about, he's, he took on the form of a slave. Now, Relate this to what I said about the, the way Roman society was ordered. So you had the, the, the free folk, the free people, and you had the slaves. The free people were at the top, the slaves are right at the bottom. Here you have Jesus in the form, not just of a free person, but in the form of God, sharing the nature of God. So higher than anything you can imagine. So if the free people were free and high and exalted, you have the nature of God that is even higher than all of that. It's like saying, would you expect a Roman citizen, a free person, to voluntarily become a slave? Not just an ordinary person, but a slave, the lowest of the low. And that was unthinkable. You wouldn't make a conscious shift from being right at the top of society to right at the bottom or even below the bottom. Nobody in their right mind would do that. But here you have Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, though he could hold it on to himself, all for himself, he voluntarily gave it all up and he took upon himself the form of a slave. So from the form of God, He's gone to the form of a slave. What a huge jump that is. What a big exchange that is. And this is where my profound thought at two o'clock this afternoon about exchanging my gardening for the ice cream truck man comes into play. I didn't want to do that because I didn't, I couldn't tolerate the noise of the ice cream truck playing on again and again and again in a loop. And I said, I was quite happy to be where I was. I didn't want to exchange that. Christ Jesus, in the form of God, he exchanged it all and came down and became the lowest of the low. That is the generosity of God who willingly did that. So just to emphasize that point, I would like for somebody to please read for us Second Corinthians chapter eight and verse nine. Two Corinthians chapter eight and verse nine. Could somebody please read that for us? Anyone just unmute yourself and go for it. Second Corinthians eight nine. Remember how generous the Lord Jesus was. 
He was rich, but he became poor for your sake, to make you rich out of his poverty. Thanks, Father Jim. So again, this demonstrates what uh, Paul's saying in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. So in this verse that Father Jed read for us, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, the Lord Jesus, who though he was rich, he became poor. So read between the lines, though he was in the form of God, he took on the form of a slave. Why? So that by his poverty, we may become rich. God took on a human form to raise our human, our lowly human nature to a divine status. That is the wonder and the mystery of the incarnation. That is what the generosity of God is all about. And so coming back to Second uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7, he emptied himself. He took on the form of a slave. He was born in human likeness and then found in human form. So now again, we're, 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 we're operating at two levels. On the one hand, somebody who was exalted became debased. He became like a slave. Somebody who had the divine nature now has the human nature. He took on the human form. He was born in human likeness and he was found in human form. Could somebody read for us verse eight? And then I'll expand on uh, the last part of verse seven. Chapter eight, uh, sorry, verse eight of chapter two. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Right, thank you, Gerard. <clears throat> <clears throat> so he, he humbled himself. Again, what, what's happening here is the same idea is being re-emphasized in different ways. And, and in the ancient world, that's how poetry was written. So you, you say the same thing in, in, in different ways. And this, this section of, of, of Philippians chapter two was a like I said, was an ancient hymn. It was an ancient poem. So what is being said here is in, in verse eight, on the one hand, sorry, in verse seven, it says he emptied himself. In verse eight, it says he humbled himself. So there, there is a complete giving up of, of status, a giving up of pride, a giving up of everything that he could have held on to, but chose not to. He became obedient. He, he humbled himself. And because he humbled himself, so every word, every section of the verse works in a kind of sequence. So he became a human being. As a human being, he became the lowest of the low, that is, he took on the form of a slave. And even within that context or with, within that category of being a slave, he further humbles himself and he becomes obedient. Obviously, in this instance, he becomes obedient to God. He became obedient to the point of death. And the way to understand this is to, to think Again, using the imagery of free and slaves, it's like a master saying to the slave, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go and die. To put it very bluntly, that's what's going on here. He became obedient to the point of death. There's no getting away from that. It was an obedience to God, meaning even to the point of death. And then note the last verse, uh, the, the last part of verse eight, even death on a cross. And this is where we go back to what we've been looking at right from our introductory sessions. A death on a cross 
was the most despicable way of dying, the most horrific way of dying, the most humiliating and brutal way of dying. And we, we, we've gone over that, so I don't, for two, almost two sessions now, so I don't want to expand on that. But the reason why I spent so much of time in sessions one and two in, in painting a background as to how horrific crucifixion was in the ancient world, it all links together whenever we think of the cross. So here's the slave who is being told to go ahead and go to his death. And he also is aware of the kind of death that he's going to die, death on a cross. And yet he was obedient. He humbled himself. He didn't protest. He didn't argue. He didn't say, this is not for me. Because again, we need to read it back now to the earlier verses. Who, who, who is this person now? He's the one who was in the form of God who had everything going for him. He was equal to God, but he didn't want to hold on to that. He let it all go willingly, voluntarily, freely. And then he consciously, and again, willingly agrees to be obedient to the point of death, even death on that dreaded, horrific cross. He agreed to crucifixion. It's as stark as that. That is the love and the generosity of God. I want to just read to you a verse from, I mean, I, I realize that we have some of our friends from the Catholic congregation here, so you might you may have heard this hymn, you may not have, but it's a good Methodist hymn. It's something like the Methodist anthem, if you want to call it that, a, a great hymn from by Charles Wesley. And it starts, and can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? So there's one stanza, stanza three, in which Charles Wesley says, he's actually paraphrasing this passage. He says, he left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace. He emptied himself of all but love. That's really interesting because in, 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 in many ways, you wonder what was in Charles Wesley's mind because when you say you empty yourself and then you say you empty it of all but love, was the emptying not quite empty? Just, do, do, do you see what I mean? If, if, if I have a glass of water and I pour it all out, I say the glass is empty. But if I say there's a little bit inside, then it's not quite empty. And what Charles Wesley is saying here is that he emptied himself of everything except for love. Now, I, I'm not in any way challenging the theology of Charles Wesley because I believe that he was a sound theologian, but I believe that he's captured here in, in, in song the essence of it all because a lot, the, the, the generosity of God is such that whatever happened was an act of love, of generous self-giving love manifested in, 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 in Jesus' incarnation and his going to the cross. And that's what Charles is trying to capture in, in, in these beautiful verses where he says he emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. This is mercy, immense and free, for oh my God, it found out me. Charles Wesley is struck again by the generosity and the magnitude of God, God made known to us in Christ Jesus, who had it all, he could have kept it all to himself, but he didn't. And he chose to, from the highest of heights, he, he chose to descend to the lowest of low places, to be a slave, to be a human, to be everything that God was not, including death, death on the cross. If that's not generosity, if that's not 
an abundance of love, what is it all about then? And I want to now refer you back to another passage, and this time it's from the Old Testament. So could somebody turn, or could you all turn and somebody read for me Isaiah chapter 42. And this passage is all about what has been described as the servant of the Lord, the suffering servant of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 42 and the first few verses, if somebody can read. Uh, let me see. Yeah, if somebody could read from verses two, uh, one to four, please. Or one and uh, verses one and two. Here is my servant. Sorry. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. Right. Okay. Thanks, Kate, for that. So this servant of the Lord that Isaiah talks about is one who, who has God's spirit upon him, but he would not protest in any way. He would not cry out. He would not lift up his voice, make it heard in the street. A humble servant, one who humbles himself. And then it says a bruised reed he will not break, a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. A servant who is humble, a servant who is obedient, a servant who is faithful to the will of God. And that's why these links are made between the suffering servant that Isaiah talks about and Jesus as the suffering servant of Christ. Well, look at another well-known passage also about Isaiah's suffering servant. And this is um, look at Isaiah chapter 53, please. And I, I'm just reading a, a random sample of verses from, from this. So Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7, for example, again about the servant, it says he was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is before its shearers. It is silent. He did not open his mouth. And we need to hear echoes here of that servant who, although he had everything, he humbled, he emptied himself. He humbled himself. He became obedient, obedient to the point of death, obedient to the voice of God. But coming back now to, to Philippians chapter 2, I want you to be able to see in these, especially verses 6, 7, and 8, a summary, as it were, of the, well, 6, 7, 8, and even 9, 10, 11, which I'll look at very shortly now. A summary of the incarnation. Now, I know that's a big word, a theological word, a word that outside of the church, people might give you a, a, a strange kind of look if you use that word. But I assume that generally those who are in the church are familiar with the word incarnation, becoming flesh. Normally, it's associated, or in a popular sense, it's associated with the birth of Christ. We use the incarnation, the word incarnation, at around Christmas when we celebrate the birth of Christ. But in, in a broader sense, the incarnation is the totality of Christ's ministry. So that word, while it does talk about the birth of Christ, it encompasses the birth, the suffering, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the exaltation, the, the, the glorification. It's, it, it, it's, it's a complete package. So when, when we talk about incarnation, in many ways we are limiting it. We are limiting that word if we confine it only to the birth of Christ. Rather, we understand the incarnation as the very purpose as to why Christ came. So birth 
death, resurrection, ascension, glorification, they're all captured in that word incarnation. And we have it going on here in verses, uh, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 right through to 11. So we have Jesus being in the form of God, starting off with God, emptying himself, being born in human likeness. So that's the start of the incarnation. Jesus, who is God, became flesh, being found in human form. He became obedient to the point of death, which, which presupposes suffering, death on the cross. There you have the crucifixion. And then we move on to 8, 9, and 10 that talks about the exaltation, the, the, the resurrection, the glorification. So we have a summary of the incarnation in these six, seven verses here. That's just as an aside that I want to share with you. But after looking at what we said about Jesus and the generosity of God in, in verses 6, 7, and 8, he, he was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Verse 9 starts by saying, therefore, meaning as a result of that obedience, as a result of the selfless, generous, voluntary act of Christ, therefore, God also highly exalted him. So we, we, we see the, the pattern. So Jesus, from the glories of heaven, he comes down to earth comes down, takes the form of the human, takes the form of the slave, becomes the lowest of the law, is put to death, death by crucifixion. But doesn't stop there. After this downward trajectory, we have a dramatic change and things start to go upwards again. God exalted him, not just exalted him, he highly exalted him. And gave him a name. Again, in the ancient world, you are given a name, which means you are given an identity. You are given a status. You are, in, in, in many instances, in the world of slavery, where, where, where slavery was prevalent, when a slave becomes a free person, they're given a name, a name of their master. They're given a different identity to show that they're no longer a slave, that they are now somebody who is respectable in society, somebody who needs to be taken seriously, somebody with a worth, somebody with a value. God gave him not a name, but God gave him the name that is above every other name. So after stooping down to the lowest of low, we see that he's now being exalted to the highest of high. He's given a name that is above every other name. So that at the name of Jesus, what happens when you hear the name Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven in the realm of the divine, on earth, in the realm of humans, under the earth, in the realm of, of, of the dead. Again, in the ancient world, the, 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 the world was divided into heaven, hell, and a kind of, uh, I'm sorry, heaven, earth, and a kind of nether world, a, a world that was the abode of the dead, the, the world that those who were no longer existing, they were in that realm. But what Paul is saying here is, whether it's with the heavenly beings, the angelic beings, or whether it's with the humans, or whether it's in that, in that shadowy world in which people no longer live in a life as we know it, if there is any form of existence in this universe, on hearing the name of Jesus, everyone respects that name a name that has great honor, a name that has a, a great value. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Or there's that great modern chorus, Jesus shall take the highest honor. That's what this is all about. 
but he didn't just get it like that. He had to go through a process. He, he, he relinquished freely, willingly, all that he, that he had, all that he was. He was in the form of God, but he didn't grasp it. He didn't hold it to himself. He gave it all up. And then God gradually gives it all back to him, gives it back to him so he's exalted to where he started off in the first place, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and, on under, and under the earth. And verse 11 is even more significant. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ or Jesus the Messiah is Lord. I want to spend some time reflecting on the word Lord. We, we have become so comfortable with associating the word Lord with Jesus, Jesus Christ. So we talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, or in our prayers we say, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And yes, we know that Lord means master, Lord means a position of authority, Lord means an important figure, and we are ascribing all that to Jesus. Yes, that's absolutely right. But again, this is where an understanding of Paul's world is so important to us. Because in the ancient world, the title Lord, you had many lords. I mean, it, it, it was unlike this day and age where you have the House of Lords. So you have Lord so-and-so and Lord so-and-so. But that was not how it worked in the, in, in the ancient world. There was one supreme lord one supreme ruler and that was the emperor the roman emperor had the exalted title of lord so caesar or, or, or whoever was the emperor at the time they were seen as lord because that that was as high a title as you could offer any anybody the emperors took on a kind of divine status but it, it, it had a political significance in the day of, of, of Paul because that title was used and reserved strictly for whoever was in power at that time as the emperor, the Roman emperor. And Paul is writing to the church in Philippi, which was a Roman colony, people who were accustomed of reserving the title Lord only for the Roman emperor. He says to them now, let me tell you something that's shocking. Let me tell you that's surprising. Let me tell you something that would blow you out of your minds. This Jesus who became a slave, who became obedient, who was crucified on a Roman cross. God has exalted him in such a manner that he is now the world's rightful Lord and emperor and ruler the Lord of the universe, every tongue, every tongue, not some tongues, not Christian tongues, not the tongues of the church in Philippi, not the tongues of the Roman Empire, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That was a hugely radical statement to make because nobody would dare to take on the title Lord, simply because nobody in people's minds deserved that kind of title. But Jesus is given such a high honor. Jesus is exalted because of what he has done, because of what he has achieved. He's exalted to that level that he is now the rightful Lord and ruler of the universe. Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why? To the glory of God the Father. Everything, ultimately, everything is for the glory of God. The chief aim of our existence is to glorify God and to praise him forever. And that's what this all reflects. The whole story of the cross, the whole story of redemption, the whole story of the generosity of God and all that he went through was out of the immense love of God, but ultimately so that we 
would give glory to God. You know that, again, a well-known hymn, Amazing Grace, the last answer says, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as a sun, I'll have no less days to sing God's praise than when I first began. It's all about praising God, all for the glory of God. And that is the great theme of scripture, that ultimately everything is about the glory of God. And so we see here in the cross, the generosity of God in which Jesus, equal to God, gave it all up freely, willingly, died the most horrific of deaths. But God systematically built him up and gave him a name that caused people to stop and think and recognize him as the true ruler of the universe, the true ruler of all that is. And this alone brings glory to God the Father. The generosity of God seen in the cross of Christ, Philippians 2 verses 6 to 11. So I'm going to stop there, let you process that, reflect on that, that great exchange that took place in Jesus' own status and how it was all given back to him. And if, if any of you have any observations or comments or questions that you'd like to ask, please do so at this point. Right, I, I, I'm not pressing you to ask any questions because I realize that it, it, it is a heavy kind of session and there's, there's, there's much to think about and reflect and, and process and um, I'm quite happy to, to, to stop there. So let's close with uh, a prayer. Let us pray. Lord, when we think upon the cross, we think of Jesus. We think of all that he has done. We think of all that Jesus had and all that he gave up for, for you, for me, for us, for this world. And we thank you that because of his obedience, because of his love and because of your generosity, you gave it all back to Jesus and you have given him a name and you have given us the privilege and meet together in that name and to worship under the name of Jesus. And so we pray as we reflect and think and go through this season of Lent, all our doings would be for, to the honour of Christ's name and to your glory. For we pray this prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Right. Thank you all for being here this evening.